If you haven't done so yet, make sure you pause the video and just reread the problem before listening on. Our first step is to draw forces that are acting on the ladder. So we can head over to the center of mass of the ladder. We can mark a point right at its center and we can draw a downward weight force pulling on the ladder. Now we head over to where the ladder is contacting the ground. Since the ladder is pressing against the ground, the ground in response will press up on the ladder. This of course would be a normal force, which we will identify as N1. In addition, there is static friction as the question notes. The ladder is trying to sort of slide to the left and in response, the friction is preventing that motion. It's actually pointing to the right and we're going to call that an F1 force to represent the friction. Now let's look at the point of contact between the ladder and the wall. Again, the ladder is pressing against the wall, so the wall presses back on the ladder. That's going to be another normal force that we will call N2. And then also the ladder has a tendency to slide down the wall, but because of static friction opposing that, it doesn't. So static friction is going to be pointing up, and we're going to call that static friction force F2. The next thing we need to do is apply Newton's second law, and we're going to do this first in the x direction. So we're going to say the sum of the forces in the x direction is going to equal zero. We know it equals zero because the ladder is indeed in equilibrium. Now, for forces acting in the x direction, we would have the F1 force and the normal force N2. We're going to assume that to the right is positive and to the left is negative, and therefore we would have F1 minus N2 and that would be set equal to zero. What we want to do next is isolate N2. We do that by subtracting F1 from both sides of the equation and then dividing by negative one. So we can see that N2 has the same magnitude as F1. Now let's recall that F1 is a static frictional force and static friction has the form of a coefficient of static friction multiplied by a normal force. So if you look back at where F1 is acting, you can see that the normal force over there is indeed N1. So in other words, we can say that F1, that static friction force, is going to equal the coefficient of static friction multiplied by N1. We're going to make a substitution. We're going to plug this expression for F1 into our equation over here. And for now, we're going to put that equation on hold and refer back to it momentarily. But before we do that, let's go and apply Newton's second law in the y direction. So we can say that the sum of the forces acting in the y direction is going to equal zero. We will highlight the forces acting in the y direction. There are three of them. These are the forces acting in the vertical, aka y direction. We will assume that upward is positive and downward is negative. So for the positive forces, we would have F2 and the normal force N1, and then we would subtract the weight W, and then that's going to be set equal to zero. Now we want to isolate N1 just like we isolated N2 previously. So we would add the weight over to the other side and subtract F2. So here is our expression for N1. Now let's talk about F2. Again, that's a static frictional force. F2 would equal the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force N2. So we'll make a substitution for F2 by writing that as the coefficient of static fric friction multiplied by N2. Now, what's interesting here is that we have an expression for N2. We developed that a couple of minutes ago. We're going to plug that in for the N2 of our current equation that is solved for N1. And we can simplify that equation by multiplying the mu s's to make mu s squared. Next, we're going to actually solve this for the normal force. So to both sides of the equation, let's add this term mu s squared times n1. So they cancel out on the right hand side. And then on the left side, we'll factor out an n1. It's the greatest common factor that would leave us with another factor of one plus mu s squared. This will equal weight. And then we'll divide both sides by that bracketed term. The question tells us that mu s is equal to 0.5, so let's plug that in. We end up with 1.25 in the denominator, but because it's in the denominator, we would do 1 divided by 1.25. That's going to give us 0.8. So we are left with n1 equaling 0.8 times w. That's a result we will refer to later on. In addition, we want a solution here for n2. Now, n2 was mu s times n1. Let's write that down. And we know N1, we just solved for it. It's 0.8 times the weight. So we'll make another substitution right here. 
and then mu s is 0.5. So you're multiplying 0.5 by 0.8, which gives you 0.4. So n2 is equal to 0.4 times the weight. Now this is a lot of mathematical maneuvering, but we're going to be using these two results in a torque equation, which we will develop right now. Now to develop our torque equation, we need to remind ourselves that torque is equal to a force times the distance to a pivot point times the sine of an angle between the force and, in this case, the ladder. Now, the pivot point has not yet been selected, but what we will do is select the pivot to be located at the bottom section of the ladder where it contacts the ground. And the reason we are going to do that is because that would allow these two forces, which are both passing through the pivot point, to exert zero torque. So it's very important to understand that any force passing through the pivot exerts zero torque. So we can basically eliminate these two forces from our torque equation. Now let's look at the W force right here. And our goal was to find theta. Let's make sure we understand that this angle right here is going to be 90 minus theta. And if you're puzzled as to why that is, just notice that you have a right triangle. Perhaps we can outline it right there. That's a right triangle. Here's a right angle. We know this angle is theta, so the only way that these three angles inside the right triangle would equal 180 is if that third angle was 90 minus theta. So that's that angle right there, and we're going to now set up an expression for the torque exerted by the W force. So we would take the weight force W, we would multiply it by the distance to the pivot, now the distance from the weight force to the pivot is just half the length of the ladder, so that's L divided by 2, and then multiplied by the sine of the angle between the weight and the ladder, and again that angle is 90 minus theta. Now you also want to ask yourself whether that torque exerted by the weight force is positive or negative. This can be a little bit tricky for some students to see, but if we have a ladder pivoted down here and we're pulling down on it, that's going to cause the ladder to go clockwise, which means it's going to have negative torque. Remember, clockwise torque is negative torque. So that takes care of the W force. Let's head over to the N2 force. To get that torque, we're going to take N2, multiply it by the distance to the pivot, and look at the distance from N2 to the pivot. That's the entire length of the ladder. So that'll be times L. And then the angle between N2 and the ladder is this angle right here. That's the same angle as the theta. And again, if you're puzzled by that, just remember some high school geometry that if you have a letter Z shape and this angle right there is marked theta, then the angle up top is also theta. They're known as alternate interior angles. So that's going to be times the sine of theta. And then that normal force will exert a counterclockwise torque. Think of a ladder pivoted right here. If you pull the ladder that way, the ladder is going to have a tendency to rotate in a counterclockwise fashion, so that's going to be positive torque. And then the last force whose torque we must consider is F2, so that's going to be the F2 force multiplied by the length of the ladder, multiplied by the sine of an angle between F2 and the ladder. This one's a little bit tricky to notice, so let's see if we can make sense of that. Maybe what we can do is extend the ladder just a little bit right here, and we're going to be looking for the angle between F and the ladder. So basically that angle right there. Now if you look carefully, that angle plus the other angle marked theta, and then this angle which is 90 degrees, would make a straight line. So those three angles together make a straight line, which just disappeared on me, of course. And in fact, let's just call that theta prime because it might not be the same as theta. So it's a little tricky to see, perhaps, but if you look at that carefully, theta plus 90 plus the angle that we just called theta prime, they have to form a straight line, so that would equal 180. And therefore, when you solve that for theta prime, you would get, let's see, you subtract 90 from both sides and subtract that theta, you would get 90 minus theta. So we have another 90 minus theta in our equation, and then this is all set equal to zero. Now time for a trigonometric identity. The sine of 90 minus theta is the same of cos theta. So we're going to make a substitution there, and then right over here, we're also going to make that same substitution. Now we are almost there. Let's look at this N2 earlier. N2 was determined to be 0.4 times the W, so let's make that substitution. And then in addition, this F2, let's see if we can go back and find something useful, F2 was mu s times N2. So we're going to make that substitution as well. 
Okay, holy smokes, but now we're going to make yet another substitution because, again, remember, N2 was 0.4W, so we're going to plug that in right there for N2. We know right here that that mu s was 0.5, so 0.5 times 0.4 is 0.2. So we'll make a little bit further adjustment there. And at long last, we have something incredibly useful for finding the angle theta. Because if we look carefully, the w appears in all of the terms. So we can divide both sides of the equation by w, essentially canceling it out. And then L appears in all terms. So we can divide every term by L, and that allows us to cancel out the L's as well. Be careful over here. When you divide by L, that's going to be 1 half. So let's now rewrite the formula. We can gather up some like terms. We have negative 0.5 cos theta plus 0.2 cos theta, which gives us minus 0.3 cos theta. Let's add that 0.3 cos theta over to the other side. So now we would have that. We could divide both sides by cos theta. And if you're wondering why we're going to do that, if we divide both sides by cos theta, the cos thetas cancel out on the right-hand side, and now you have a trigonometric identity. Right here, you have sine divided by cosine. So that's tangent. You have 0.4. Tangent of theta is equal to 0.3. You can divide both sides by 0.4. This gives you tangent of theta is equal to 0.75. And finally, you do the inverse tangent on both sides in order to get the angle. And when you put that into your calculator, you will get the angle is approximately 36.9 degrees. Just make sure your calculator is set to degree mode. That, at long last, is the correct answer to the question.